G'day boys and welcome to our video explaining stars. So first of all let me introduce you to the HR diagram. The great thing about HR diagrams is that they will stop you from feeling bad for all of the ancient people who died of horrible diseases like malaria. This is because on the x-axis you've got temperature, which has temperature decreasing as you go further along. And even though I'd personally fail a paper for doing this just on principle, it isn't enough by itself to inspire me to create Roku's Basilisk, as aside from being dumb, it doesn't really cause any issues, and if being dumb was a minor offence then I'd get a death sentence. Where the HR diagram really goes from putting lead in gasoline to trickle down economics is on the y-axis, as in why the fuck did we have to get stuck with a system that was made 50 years before the burning of the Library of Alexandria, which, it unfortunately wasn't lost in, where brighter stars have smaller magnitudes. I mean I swear every time I use this I have to perform more mental gymnastics than Michael Bay trying to figure out a loophole in a state's age of consent. Right, so pretty much every star when it is born can be found along this line here known as the main sequence, which is where stars will spend 90% of their life in pretty much the same spot. Relatable. For the most part the only factor which determines where on the main sequence a star is located is its mass, which, as a star gets heavier and heavier, it also gets brighter and hotter, with hotter stars appearing more blue. So, at the bottom right we've got the red dwarfs, which are the smallest class of star and are generally in the range of a twelfth to a half the mass of the sun. And also like the sun and all stars in the main sequence, they turn hydrogen into helium. They're pretty cool, literally, and as you can tell by their position on the diagram, they're also not very bright. As in something that surprised me and also shows why I love astrophysics so much is that there was a red dwarf that came less than a light year away from us 70,000 years ago. Meaning it passed for our solar system but wasn't even the brightest star in the sky. In fact, even at its closest, it was 500 times dimmer than is needed to see with the naked eye. One advantage of being dim, aside from being able to enjoy NASCAR, is that red dwarves take longer to go through all of their fuel, which pretty much makes them the Queen Elizabeth- oh wait no, she's in a box. Anyways, unlike Lizzie, red dwarves are likely to live for trillions of years, which might be counterintuitive if you know that the sun is much bigger, but is already halfway through its 10 billion year lifespan. But this is simply because, as a star gets bigger, its gravitational force increases faster than the amount of time the extra fuel adds, and thus it needs to burn through more fuel to oppose and balance out the collapsing force. Though, personally, I find that LSD is a much better way of stopping the crushing weight of existence rather than being in a constant state of exploding, but to each their own. Anyways, a star's mass affects its lifespan so much that the largest stars of around 30 masses of the sun only live for around 10 million years before dying. At the end of their life, stars demonstrate that they are growers, not showers, as they begin moving off the main sequence and entering into the giant phase, which is where it spends the remaining 10% of its life. At this point the star runs out of hydrogen to fuse together, causing the core to contract and increase the amount of pressure it creates, making the star begin fusing heavier and heavier elements together, releasing far more heat than it was during the dwarf phase. Causing the star to expand and become brighter, though the outer layer becomes cooler since the surface area, and therefore the area it has to radiate from, increases faster than the rate at which the core creates heat. Eventually the star reaches a point where it can no longer fuse any new elements together. At this point stars with a mass greater than 8 times that of the sun will explode with the force of a thousand gerbils in a microwave and either turn into a neutron star or a black hole. Though, I don't feel confident enough in my knowledge to give you a firm rule to determine which path it will follow, unlike for stars with less than 5 to 8 masses of the sun. They usually follow a similar path that our sun will follow, which has become so bright that its own solar wind begins blowing away at its outer layer of lighter elements such as the remaining hydrogen and helium. Eventually, leaving behind a white dwarf, a core of hot electron degenerate matter which no longer fuses elements together and instead slowly cools to darkness over billions of years. Which, although literal eons to us, are but a mere figurative flash in the pan to the indifferent and unending universe. Indeed it is likely, dear viewer, that as a cosmos wanes, and the last vestiges of stars and the civilizations that they nourished fade from the ever dimming sky, that these remnants of our time, of plenty, will bring forth the last photons to warm the faces of our descendants as they too follow us as we followed those before us in succumbing to the unending march of entropy. Ironically, not with the bang that created us, but with the whimper befitting of a universe that shall not create or wonder anymore.